Morning, folks. So uh, we're into final projects and we will be changing the consulting schedule this weekend. So starting Sunday, there will be six hours of open lab. Starting this Sunday. Oh, which is daylight savings time. You get an extra hour of sleep Saturday night. So you'd be in great shape to come to lab for six hours on Sunday. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to keep the lab open as much as possible. And I strongly suggest that you take up the early hours because the last two weeks it's going to be crowded and hot in there. So the more, the more you can front load time in the lab, the better off you'll be. It's going to be like a ghost town in there this week. So keep your eye out on Piazza for a new consulting schedule. It'll also be on the, on the, the web page, the class web page schedule. Oh, it says staff and schedule right here. If you go down there, the, the TAs are not going to change their, uh, their lab times, but the TAs will no longer, the TA will no longer, there will no longer be a TA who is um, consulting in the section along with the TA in charge. By the way, you like the color scheme? I'll try and get it fixed by next week. So, it's going to be single coverage. I'm going to be there most days. So I'm going to be there from about 9 in the morning or whenever somebody asks to open up until about 4.30. And I'll be there most weekdays. So try and find me at least once a week. I can often come up with uh, things that even the TAs don't think of. Uh, we will then modify the office hours schedule here to represent the, the, the new schedule. But, but the summary is it's going to be most evenings plus six hours on Sunday right now. We'll expand into Saturday in a couple of weeks, but my guess is there's not going to be much uh, call for a Saturday lab for a week or two. Any questions on that? Stay tuned for the exact times. First batch of orders went in this morning for parts. Remember, we have a fairly good stock of parts in lab, and you may want to ask to see if we have a part before you order it. The uh, people were quite good about following directions. I didn't have to do too much uh, hacking around and editing with uh, uh, lists of parts. There are a couple of people that were way over in, in the amount of money. You could spend $20 total in five weeks on my account. You, spend as, you could spend up to $125 on your own, of your own money. But my, on, on my money, it's $20 per group for the whole project. This is for small stuff, an integrated circuit, maybe a, a Bluetooth module, but not too much more than that. I can't afford more than that. That's already up to $800 or $1,000 for the class. Questions? Now, final project. I sent out a lengthy Piazza post about scheduling demos. So you're, you have to demo your project. The project demo is due by the end of the last lab period. The last lab period is the week that ends in December 1st. However, there is a no, no uh, penalty optional extension to the 4th, 5th, and 6th. That's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the first full week in December. 
if you choose to go into the fourth, fifth, sixth week, then you must sign up for a demo slot and sign up will be open at 1200 noon on December 1st. I usually get 20 emails in one minute. It's very entertaining. Watch the <laughs> watch it fill up. So, uh, but this is, the idea of noon is to give you all enough warning to, pl uh, on the first, to give you all enough warning to plan when you actually want to demo because you may have to work around finals that are also starting to be scheduled on the 6th and you may want to who knows um, go early so think about that a little bit before the first sign up for a time slot most people take the optional extension a few people will demo early Remember though that if you demo on the 6th, if you demo on the 6th, you can demo up until 4 o'clock. Your final report is due in final form at 11 p.m. that night. So therefore, that's, a, that's mandated by the university. Therefore, you must be writing while you're demoing and before because otherwise, You'll be typing your fingers down to the nubbins that day. That'd be so sad. So, <laughs> so think about the, the scheduling and get ready for, for a demo in a timely fashion. Any questions on that? Talk more as time goes on. Budget is 125, as I've said. One group ordered H bridges in a staggered lead package. These things are the ugliest package you ever saw. Uh, let me see. Can I find one online in a in a uh, the LM 298s? I think. L298, maybe that's what it is. Yeah, this, this bad boy. These are big, heavy H bridges, 46 volts, 4 amps. But look at that pinout. The pinout, you can't quite tell from the diagram. The pins are on 0.1 inch centers. Good. Because that fits into a whiteboard. But the front row is offset 0 0.5 inches relative to the back row. Bad. Because now it doesn't fit in any solderless board at all. So the pins are like, instead of being like this, they're a half a, half a pitch off. They're staggered. You can, you can handle this. You have to end up either building a custom socket or soldering a wire to each lead, but it's better not to use uh, these strange staggered packages. There's a 296, or it's L296, not LM, sorry. L296 Not that though. Often I have some in the lab there. There uh H bridges in P dip 14. They are good for a half an amp per per transistor. So and they're they're quite easy to use since they're in p-dip one group specified a leadless accelerometer 
Don't do that, folks. This ball grid, it's cheap. Don't do it. You can't solder it, you can't handle it. So again, any other questions on final projects? I had a, I had a uh, request to talk about I2C, so I will. <clears throat> I2C is meant for short distance communication between integrated circuits on the same, same board. It uses a, it's a synchronous protocol. It uses a clock line and, a, and one data line, which is bi-directional. Handles all of the data. There is a required pull-up whose value, whose resistance value is dependent upon the number of peripherals, but start with, say, 4K or 5K. 2.4 is a little low, not too bad. And the bus has an electrical protocol, which is unusual. It is open collector. That means there is no pull-up transistor on the output. And there is slew rate, slew rate control on the transistors so that the switches, so the switches and the transistors don't turn on or off too fast. So they, so the edges are controlled presumably to cut down on interference with other protocols. But this does limit the speed to about 400 kilohertz, which is deathly slow compared to SPI. On the other hand, as we'll see in a minute, because the bus data includes the address, you can have up to 128 different integrated circuits on the same I2C bus, whereas you cannot do that with SPI. Now, this is slightly misleading because each of the chips that has, is on the bus has to have a hardware-defined address. Lots of companies set the address to 000. zero, zero. Oh, well, that sucks because now everything you try and hook on the bus has the same address and you can't do it. So what will often happen is that of the seven bit address, four bits will be set and, and not changeable and then maybe Three bits will be settable to one zero, so you can put up to seven devices of the same kind on the bus. Why would you want to do that? Well, let's say you wanted a IMU on your wrist, your elbow, and your shoulder. It would be nice to give them unique addresses. Let's say you needed a ton of, of static RAM, I2C static RAM, or non-volatile RAM. Maybe you need to use eight different packages to get as much RAM as you need. It would be nice to address all of those. There are, a way, there are ways around this limitation, but when you use those methods, it starts to look more like an SPI chip select line. So there are, there are some limitations on the addressing. I don't think anybody ever really puts 128 devices on the bus but you could put five or six or eight. So the bus is uh, bi-directional. I said that. There's a master that always produces the, the clock. And
Transactions are managed by the master who will address a slave, address a peripheral, and then ask for data or send data and the bit pattern that you transmit can get a little obscure but I'll go through that in a minute data transfer can only be initiated when the bus is not busy during data transfer, the data must data line must remain stable whenever S clock is high. Okay, you say, well, for data integrity, that makes sense, but there's more. If the data line changes while the S clock is high, it's not an error, it's a signal to the bus that you want to stop a read or stop a write or stop a read and start a write you can do a start, a stop, or a stop start during one clock cycle by manipulating the data line while S clock is high. So a start condition will be a drop in the data line while the S clock is high that says I'm starting to send then uh, data or address valid while while the while the clock is high then the receiving end has to send an ACK or a NACK depending upon a set of conditions that we'll talk about and then there can be a stop condition which is a rise in the data line during the clock high. However, you can also have a stop immediately followed by a start during the same clock cycle, which allows the transaction to be uninterruptible by another master and yet go from a, re a read mode to a write mode or a write mode to a read mode. So, as an example, this is a protocol for a serial EEPROM. So this would be uh, random access memory, read-only random access memory. And what you would do would be to send a start bit, then an address, and in this case the top four bits are are set to 1010 there's three addressable bits and then the last bit the eighth bit in the address is the read write bit so the last bit here says that this is going to be a write then the slave sends back an act saying yep I got the address then the master will send a I gotta figure out why I can't do this update I don't have enough permissions but I don't know who does so uh, then, then the master sends a payload byte which will be the EEPROM address high byte this was the bus address of the device this is the internal EEPROM address you want to read then it sends the EEPROM address low byte there has to be an, a NAC in each of these positions then the data byte is going to be sent back from the slave to the master so we have to go from write mode to read mode so we're going to do a restart which is a stop followed by a start we're going to send the bus address again because the first byte of a after a start is always the bus address of the device 
then at that point the slave sends an ACK and then it sends the data byte and then the master sends back a NAC. Then the master sends a stop at which time the system becomes idle. I would say that getting the message structure right for one of these devices is the hardest part of getting the I2C running because every single chip has a different protocol. You're always the high level, the I2C protocol is always going to be an address with a read write bit followed by a read or a write, a write of data but what the contents of that data is depends on the integrated circuit that you're hooking up. And again, I would say it's about a person week's work to get that message formatting correct. So, if you can find an example that makes any sense to you, use it. There's some details here of what this protocol does. There's a clock that has to be set and the the formula is obscure enough that I always just use the table. So if we're going for a 40 megahertz system clock and we want a 400 kilohertz uh, I2C clock, then we set the BRG to 20. No, C2. We set it to C2. Now, interestingly, in 2015, the, uh, there was a bunch of projects that used I2C. The balance bot, the balancing robot project, set up an I2C for the Invencents MPU 650 IMU. Who ordered a 6050? Somebody ordered a 6050 today. And you're really going to want to look at this project because they wrote, they wrote a nice package to support that particular integrated circuit, which will cut your time down from a week to a day. But if you're not here, that's OK, too. And the Blimpo project, so they, they built a little platform out of foam board, had three fan motors on it, CPU and an IMU, and as the board tilted, the fans kept it level. And also, the, this thing was suspended be beneath three one-meter balloons. How did they get the three one-meter balloons to the, from the mall to here? Well, it took two trips in there, Dotson. But that's okay. Anyways, so they were floating there, they were flying this thing around the lab, taking up a large part of the lab, and the result was that they could navigate this dirigible around the, around the lab rather accurately because they were using the acceler 3D accelerometer to get the, <coughs> the axis, or the, to keep everything level and, and, and the thrust in the right direction. It, also, interestingly, it worked by accident. <coughs> they they inline, inlined all the codes, all of the code for this. But I went through the I went through the code, and the, they set the baud rate to ninety six hundred as if it was a serial modem, and it should have been. It should have been C2, not 9600. But it turns out because of the bit length of the register, the value wrapped around, it was only an 8 bit register, it wrapped a hexadecimal 80, which happened to be in the useful range of rates for that particular integrated circuit. So, this worked by dumb luck. Mm -hmm. 
So the setup time, the setup time for Oh, you're going to want to read the, the I2C master in, in PLIB because that, that is actually rather useful. But the, let's go to append, appendix, self-balancing robot. This is a nice robot. It, uh, by the time they were done with it, it would stand up and, and balance for, for uh, minutes at a time. But down in Appendix A, which of course you're going to generate also. It's fairly well written. You might want to look at this. Your Appendix A, your Appendix A is going to say, I do allow or I do not allow my project to be on the website. In, in 2015, I did not require this because Cornell did not require this. Now Cornell requires that you sign a release saying that we can put your project up on the website and embedding that release in the web, in the, in the web report uh, is apparently good enough for the lawyers. But we have this little thing called I2C Helper which sets up the, I2, the I2C for the 6050 IMU and encapsulates all of the, the functions so that you have I2C and I2C read and I2C write to help make this a little cleaner. And there's a bunch of low-level stuff that <coughs> help make it work. But you're going to want to go through this as an example of a well-worked-out I2C system. Who's going to use I2C? For what? I should uh, know. Bluetooth. The sensor array. I sent you some. Let's see. The you know, sensor, it was a, oh, it was the humidity and temperature sensor. Yeah, there's a And so you're going to have to s figure out how to read back three values from three different registers, uh, but there's not too much setup to do on it, probably. Hopefully it's just reading, not reading back. Right, hopefully it's just reading back. On the other hand, somebody asked for a I2C Bluetooth module, and I suspect there's quite a lot of setup to do in that. What else did people ask for? Compass sensor, instead of reading. All right. Compass sensor. Did you ask for that today? Okay, good, because I don't remember that one. What else? Anybody used I2C before? And what did you think about the, de the process of developing code for it? Uh, we used it for an accelerometer for a quadcopter. And the, the hardware address was kind of a tricky part that we were messing around with for a while. But we, we got it after a couple of days. Only a couple of days? Yeah. How many people working on it? Two, so four person days. Yeah. Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. Who else? Somebody else had a hand up here. Yes. We're in the same oh yeah, but what did you? What have you developed for before? What I two C have you developed for before? A lot of random things. A lot of random things. Okay. Not <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a. Uh, I find it a, an annoying protocol to deal with, but that's partly personality dependent, probably. So, and there's an example from Northwestern, which is I2C communication between PIC32s, which I haven't tried, but at least it's well documented. I did get serial communication completely running to the big board this morning um, with simultaneously 
reading and writing the port expander, the TFT, the DAC, and the serial port. So it's all compatible. However, you have to be a little careful with a couple of things. The DAC is using SPI2 in an interrupt service routine. The port expander is using SPI2 in mainline code. So if you happen to be, if the port expander happens to be in the middle of an SPI transaction and the interrupt fires, what happens? Oh, it's not good. The SPI data from the transaction that's already started gets thrown away by the interrupt service routine and then both fail. The interrupt service routine fails to write a value and the, and the port expander fails to recognize what the heck just happened because it's asynchronous. So the result is that you have to produce a critical section in your code when you're reading or writing the port expander so that the interrupt service routine cannot happen. You have to turn off that interrupt for the few microseconds necessary to read or write the port expander. Then you can turn the interrupt back on again and hopefully you will only have missed one interrupt or maybe none. Secondly, there's another dependency and that is that the port expander wants the SPI in 8-bit mode the DAC wants it in 16-bit mode. That means that both the interrupt service routine and the DAC and, and the port expander, when they get a chance to execute, have to wait until the last transaction is done, then switch the mode from 16 to 18 or 18 to six, 16 bits, then do their thing But there is no particular, nothing fancy that you have to do to use the serial terminal. Just the interaction between the, the, the DAC and the, and the port expander. So the documentation on using the peripheral stuff will be will be here on the, under serial console, port expander, DAC, TFT, and so forth on the, on the dev, dev ports page as soon as I can get it up. The, uh, my day has been a little chopped up so I haven't gotten the code linked up yet. The only other thing you need to make that work is to go to the UART page and notice that a, mo a module is required here, a cable is required that goes from the port pins on the big board to a USB connector on the PC. And in fact, inside this blue housing is an FTDI serial to USB adapter. So this plug makes the you are look like a COM port on the PC. Once you get it set up, it's pretty handy. I might change the yes. Uh, do you have one of those uh, that we could like use if we like like if we ordered one we haven't gotten in yet? Do you have one of those that we could like play around with? Yeah, I've got a few of them. The ones that didn't get stolen last year, but. I may go back to using them next year for lab four because it's pretty handy for setting up parameters for a PID system to just be able to type them in. And it's also a, a useful model for interacting with a microcontroller. The serial port is a useful way of interacting with a microcontroller that I think needs to be talked about. I tried to do it this year without it, but I think it needs to be talked about. So I'll bring it back in next year, probably. So
How many people want the lab open tomorrow morning? Okay, you gonna be here tomorrow morning? All right, I'll, I'll open up. I'm shocked. This early in the, in the, in the sequence, but that's good. Charge time measurement unit, I haven't talked about. It's pretty well documented in the in PLIB and here. And probably in, in terms of final projects, what people would want to use it for is a capacitive touch interface. You can use anything as a as an interactor with this. You've probably seen pictures on the on, on the web someplace of people making a eight pianos, pian bananas into a keyboard where you touch the banana and it plays notes. That would be, an equi that'd be a, a, a system which is using the capacitance of your body to, to trigger an input. Most people are around 30 picofarads or so, so you have to be able to measure a fairly small capacitance. And the CTMU, the charge time measurement unit, will do that directly on the, on the microcontroller. So all you need to make an interactive contact, the microcontroller, is a wire c coming off that you can touch the end of. And then you become the switch. You don't have to be grounded. In fact, you shouldn't be grounded. You're just a big floating capacitor. Coupled to the universe at large. So, um, you may want to use the CMTU if you want to make a, a, a touch device of various sorts. We've had people do touch pianos that way. Real-time clock is useful if you want to be able to shut down the CPU and still keep time. To shut down the CPU means turn off the CPU in idle mode turn off the clocks in sleep mode. So you can't keep time using the master clock in sleep mode, but you can keep time using the real-time clock, which has a separate oscillator running at 32 kilohertz. Because with CMOS, current use is proportional to toggle frequency, to clock frequency, going to 32 kilohertz, drops you down into the microamp range for running the real-time clock. And in fact, the real-time clock unit can sit there and tick along at a microamp or so and can pull an interrupt to wake up the main CPU once a second or whatever you want. So this is quite useful for, for, low, for low current operation. which is talked about more here, power management. Um, I could talk about that more if you want to. But <clears throat> one question is then, what more do you want to hear about? If we, if we, if we, if we stop lecturing and go to lab, I expect to see you in lab. It's not optional. Yes. If we want a second pick, should we build a small board for it? <coughs> if you want a second pick, build a small board. <coughs> if you want, there's no reason to use the big board in the final project. You don't get to keep the TFTs. TFTs are mine. You can keep the board, but you don't get to keep the TFTs. And you may find that the big board is just not appropriate for, for anything for what you want to build. It's too big, it's too clunky, it takes too much power. It takes a lot of power because of that TFT. 100 mils, 200 mils, something in that region. If you run the CPU on the small board, you'll run about 30 mils. Small board is, will take you minutes to build. You don't have to put a header on it, which means there's no cost of the header. header headers are five cents a pin. If you use the big board, you have 65 pins on there. That's, or is it 10 cents a pin? What did I say? Let me look at that. If 
five cents a pin for head, uh, header sockets or plugs. That's about the, the part, what it cost me. So you're talking uh, you know, a couple of bucks worth of pins on the big board. You probably are going to want to strip it down quite a bit depending on what you're going to build and therefore it makes sense to build a small board or two or three small boards. Break down the whiteboard is like a breadboard, right? Solderless board, whiteboard is, is, is each one that is in your final design is six dollars. Yeah. I'm pricing this in such a way to encourage you to solder for a couple of reasons. It's more reliable and you can take it with you. It's on a whiteboard, I want them back. Yes. Did you say jumper cables? I'm guessing those are the ones with like the pin headers on either side. Any anything that's terminated on the ends is are ten cents each. Right. Which is about the actual cost. I didn't see wire anywhere. There's tons of wire in the lab. I, I mean like pricing wise, is there is there wire's any? free. Okay, great. Resistors are free. Cool. The actual cost of a resistor when when ordering by the thousand is forty four dollars a thousand. Which makes it what? Four cents each? 0.4 cents each. Four cents each. 4.4 cents each. I'll absorb that. Disc ceramic capacitors, same deal. Pennies each. Don't bother to, uh, to budget them. Op amps, 45 cents. Don't bother. On the other hand, the DACs are like six or eight dollars each. So those get budgeted. Don't put a DAC in there unless you need it. Again, suggesting don't use the big board unless you actually need everything on the big board. If you need a port expander, use the big board. And so the libraries are already written, the wiring is already done. But if you're going to hook a radio to the microcontroller, and that's it, don't use the big board. Yes? Do you charge for the small board, or is it just like $5 for the thick and small board altogether? What did I say here? Custom PC board. Oh, that was the, the custom PC board is the big board. Okay. That's actually a little less than it costs. I'll, I'll, I'll have that for the small board. How's that? Oh my god. Well, it says charge for the socket. Yes. You have to socket the pick, so. You have to socket the pick. So then do you have to count the socket for the pick on the board? <laughs> you build the board, I'll give you the socket. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you just talk about the progress reports? Well, all, every TA can choose a progress report format that they like and, and ask for anything they want. So I can tell you in general that they're going to want to be convinced that you're making progress each week. That is to say, they want to see you work, they want to know what you did, and they want to know your plans for the next week. There's going to be a sanity check in about a week and a half from now to say, are you making progress? Do you think you, what you thought you could do, you, do you still think you can do? In two and a half weeks from now, or about at the end of week three, there's going to be a do or die cutoff. It's going to say, if you haven't made progress on the project, you are choosing a new project. All right, if, you, if, if it's too hard, you're cutting it loose and going for a new one. All right, scale down, simplify, maybe get forced reassignment. But, so we want to see real progress by the end of week three to convince us that you can do what you said you could do. Because if you only have two weeks left, 
you can probably still pull something out. When it gets down to one week left, not so likely. I have seen people do it. They don't look very good or smell very good by the end of the next week, but yeah, okay. But you don't want to do that. You want to sleep. Sleep is good for you. Um, so about, about two weeks from now, I'm going to ask you a bunch of hard questions in lab. Is this working? Is it not working? What do you have to simplify? Was doing optical recognition of iris patterns really a good idea? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. What else? So our TAs will ask us for like a certain format? And they, I believe they have. But uh, check on Piazza, check with your TA. All right. Some TAs will say, I just want to talk to you in lab. Some TAs will say, I want it written the night before the lab. It could be anything that the TA wants. See you Wednesday.